Hello, everyone. Welcome to our EHG Regional Learning Collaborative session on addressing the intersection of HIV and substance use. My name is Elena Rosenberg Carlson, and I'm the EHG coordinator here at the UCLA Center for HIV Identification, Prevention, and Treatment Services, or CHIPS. For anyone who's new to the collaborative, our purpose is to facilitate knowledge sharing and support collective action across California's EHG phase one counties to help accomplish our shared EHG goals. And we also welcome folks from outside these eight counties to join the sessions and learn together with us. So welcome to everyone on the line this morning. In the chat, you should see an option to send a message to all panelists and attendees or to everyone. If you haven't yet, please use that option now to introduce yourself to everyone here on the call by sharing your name, location, and affiliation. Next slide, please. So during today's session, we'll be discussing strategies and approaches to address problematic substance use and its impact on the HIV epidemic here in California. We'll begin with presentations and then move into panel discussion and open Q&A. As always, please feel free to submit questions at any time during the session using the Q&A function on your Zoom control panel. We'll use the Q&A function to collect and respond to questions throughout the session and also during the live Q&A at the end. We'll additionally keep the chat function open in case you'd like to share comments or resources with the group at any time. So feel free to use both the Q&A and the chat functions throughout the session. I also wanna note that we are recording the session and we'll post the recording and slides on our EHE regional response webpage within the next few days. So now I'm happy to introduce Alessandra Ross, Chief of the Harm Reduction Unit at the California Department of Public Health Office of AIDS. Thanks for joining us this morning, Alessandra. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Let me just set up my slides and get going. I'm, uh, I'm the Chief of the Harm Reduction Unit, and we're within the California Department of Public Health Office of AIDS in the HIV prevention branch, but we're, we're really, we really have an integrated mission. So we are about HIV prevention, yes, but also hepatitis C prevention, overdose prevention response, obviously overdose has spiked horribly during the pandemic. And we're also working to dismantle stigma, the policies and practices that have been put in place over decades of the war on drugs. So we're still experiencing regularly people who use drugs being told to go away, people being denied services and told, go away and come back when you're ready to get serious about your recovery, or there are a lot of different ways to fill in that sentence and it's never good. Um, so we're really encouraging people to you know, follow the basic principles of harm reduction, one of which is to work with people while they are continuing to use drugs. So that means welcoming people in, treating their HIV, curing their hepatitis C, and then finding out what else can we work on together? What are your own priorities? So that's the approach that we're taking and really encouraging um, local health departments and local CBOs to take as well as many of these are uh, the health departments and the CBOs that are um, leaders in adopting a harm reduction approach. Our um, programs really revolve around syringe services programs as the backbone of the work that we do. We do it with a couple of different collaborators. SSPs in California show up in a lot of different ways. They're, they're FQHCs, they're clinics, they're um, health departments, they are scrappy little volunteer organizations. So there's a lot of variety in um, how uh, syringe services are offered. Um, so we have one program, the cheer, what we call Cheery, that um, funds staffing. We fund supplies. We also authorize new syringe services programs. We fund technical assistance and offer it ourselves. So if uh, you know a health clinic wants to add syringe services or add naloxone, and they're having trouble with their HRSA uh, project officer, they can contact us, and that's our bread and butter. We love that stuff. Um, and then I already mentioned policy programs. We also love that. Um, so I wanna highlight a little bit from Cheery, um, and that is the program that was funded four years ago by the legislature to fund staffing at SSPs. And that has been um, 
really extraordinary because we haven't been able to fund staffing since uh, 2008. And so we're seeing a lot of programs that have been all volunteer run suddenly have paid staff. Um, we really rely on our partner in this, which is National Harm Reduction Coalition to provide TA um, and that's training, but it's also like direct coaching when you run into your first uh, problem with a, with a new hire, for example. So there's been a lot of um, excitement and um, growing pains as well. Um, another part of the project is an evaluation point in time survey of um, the surveys program participants all throughout California. So we've got rural, urban, and um, suburban programs asking people who use drugs and who access syringe services, how's it going? What Tell us about what you need and what you observe. Um, and here's a crowded but kind of delightful looking slide that I'll walk you through a little bit from the last PIT survey, point in time survey. And if you look on the left, the drug use data almost 75% regularly used a stimulant, and that was mostly methamphetamine. So methamphetamine continues to be Californians' illicit substance of, of choice, um, but almost 56% also used an opiate, and that was mostly um, fentanyl. 83% reported regularly smoking at least one drug, and smoking was the most common route of administration. Um, so that was both smoking fentanyl and methamphetamine. And really interestingly, 36% of all participants indicated if they use fentanyl that they had switched from injecting to smoking in the last six months. So that's a very rapid change. Um, we, our supplies catalog includes smoking supplies. Um, SSPs in California have been giving out pipes for, for decades now, but it had been a, a legal gray area. Um, and in 2018, advocates worked with the legislator, le, legislature to change the law to allow health departments, the state and local health departments, to declare supplies to be necessary for preventing uh, transmission of disease or preventing injury. And that allowed us to declare all the supplies that are given out by SSPs as a regular part of their program to be exempt from paraphernalia laws, from both possession laws and distribution laws. So that means that people can possess pipes, people can be given pipes, um, but this is a change that is not without controversy. Um, we've done a Dear colleague letter, we have done a, a pipes brief, we've done webinars, we've been talking about pipes um, for a while now. And um, at the local level, at the SSP level, it's incredibly popular. Um, program participants are thrilled to get pipes and um, programs are seeing people that they'd never seen before, more people of color coming in. Um, so it feels like a, a real way of meeting people's needs. But law enforcement is, um, often opposed. Um, some local health departments, especially in more politically conservative areas, are feel nervous about including um, pipes in their in the work that they do. Um, so we're kind of working with people one-on-one -on -one and also working on how to better communicate these changes to law enforcement as a whole. We're also working with a new collaboration with the RTI International. They've done some, some preliminary studies on this transition away from injecting and to smoking in San Francisco. And we'll be working with them this year to do a full evaluation of our pipes distri distribution program. A couple of other things that um, we've been working on through the clearinghouse, um, what is spending money. <laughs> Last year, there was an increase um, after many years of advocates requesting this increase uh, from $3 million to $6 million, which was desperately needed because uh, when the program started in 2016, we had 36 SSPs and we now have 64. So a big increase in the number of programs really needed more supplies. So we've been able to provide more supplies, but we've also been able to do a couple of special projects um, one is increase um, the number of test counselors. Um, you can see, and I think most of us are aware that the testing incidents went way down during the pandemic, including in SSPs, but we'd already seen a decrease in the number of programs that were offering um, HIV and hepatitis C testing. So we worked with the Alliance Health Project to offer 60 training slots for test counselors. 
um, almost half the programs signed up and seven of those had never been able to offer HIV testing before. So we're excited to see how this is gonna pan out in the next years, couple of years. Um, another uh, just delightful project that we were able to do is uh, we were able to do some mini grants through the clearinghouse. And um, what you see there on the left is a picture of uh, naloxone stapled to a telephone pole. It is called the Tree of Life and is a invention of a woman named Russia who works with the Sidewalk Project in LA. And she had been um, stapling naloxone to trees and telephone poles throughout Skid Row um, in case people overdosed. And um, she goes around and refills those um, naloxone boxes. And um, Sidewalk Project asked for a mini grant to get uh, Russia a staple gun and uh, more naloxone and a, a tricycle with a basket so that she could go around and do her work. Um, and there she is, looking um, pretty pleased. Um, so that is, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to see some small projects um, that really make a difference. I wanna highlight a couple of things that are not our work, but um, that we're involved with um, either as providing additional technical assistance or just supporting and um, waiting and watching the exciting development. One is the DHCS contingency management pilot, um, which allows uh, a whole host of counties to start um, contingency management projects. And you can see here the list of programs that have uh, counties that have already opted in. Um, for phase one, and then you can see phase two on the right. It was really uh, um, wonderful to see how many counties jumped on this opportunity. Um, we also have exciting things happening in two counties that I want to highlight. There, there is so much that's happening that's good right now, but I do want to highlight San Diego because last year San Diego eliminated its uh, more than 20 year ban on funding syringe services programs. And they developed a, an incredibly comprehensive approach to looking at what the entire county needs. They're rapidly expanding the lock zone throughout the county and they will have four new SSPs um, by the end of this year. So that's one exciting development there. And I wanna highlight Los Angeles as well. So much happening, two new SSPs in, California, in uh, Los Angeles recently authorized um, by the city of Los Angeles and West Hollywood, first new programs in more than 20 years, um, significant investments in harm reduction through the Measure J money, and then um, jail-based naloxone. You can see there the, um, the vending machine that's available in jails for people being discharged so they can have naloxone with them for themselves or for their community. Um, I am at uh, cdph.ca.gov. Feel free to pepper me with questions or suggestions, and I will stop share and pass it back over to our hosts. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much, Alessandra. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, I do want to note one more time that we are happy to take questions at any time in the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. So I know um, we've already gotten a couple of great questions in the chat. Um, if you can enter those in the Q&A function and any other questions you might have, that would be great. Um, we love to you know, make sure that we're not missing any questions by collecting them all in the Q&A box. And we'll be sure to answer those during the session um, and or during the live Q&A at the end. So now I'm very excited to introduce our next presenter, Roger Sedilas, who is the program manager for substance abuse programs at APLA Health. Good morning, Roger. Good morning. Thank you, Elena. Let me share my screen real quick. Um, so yes, everyone, once again, my name is Roger Sedilas, and I manage the substance abuse programs at the Out Here Sexual Health Center in Bowen Hills, California, in Los Angeles. And uh, we are powered by APLA Health, and we're part of the Community Resources Department. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm here to give you an overview of our approach to address the interaction between you know, HIV and substance use. <clears throat> so in general, all of the programs are for men who have sex with men who use methamphetamine. Um, some of the goals are to empower participants to make informed choices, uh, to reduce the negative consequences uh, related to their use, drug, and their sexual behaviors, 
focus on key public health areas during the implementation of health navigation sessions. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, contingency management. Uh, we provide a linkage to PrEP, PEP, HIV, STDs, um, and uh, support groups. But also, even if it's not part of our scope of work, uh, we make sure that our clients get services that they need, even if it's not something that we provide, but we link them into mental health services, food banks, uh, uh, drug treatment if they are ready to take that step as well. Um, and so, you know, why, what's the problem, right? So we, we have heard uh, a lot already with Alexandra of, of all of the issues related to Matthew Speck. So to add to that, um, just some information and some uh, numbers that I have, according to, so sorry, I have, according to the data brief from March of 2019 by the Los Angeles County Safi, at a national level, 195,000 individuals indicated meth use in 2007. Um, sorry, screen. Um, and then uh, deaths in LA County listed meth poisoning as the cause of death uh, and drug overdose as the underlying cause of death, increasing from um, 43 in 2008 to 347 in 2017. Also according to Los Angeles County, 66% uh, in 2017 of clients who reported meth as the primary drug problem had used meth before and during sex in the past year. Latinos accounted for the majority of clients with the primary meth problem in LA County with a 63% followed by white 22, black 10% nation Pacific Islander 2%. Um, so why harm reduction-based programs? We know that uh, injection and non-injection drug users are elevated at risk for HIV transmission acquisition, lack of HIV and STD testing and treatment. Um, a lot of times because they just don't, don't feel, um, don't trust the clinics or service providers. When experiencing withdrawal, a person may encounter a lower number of uh, services available to them due to client, patient, mistrust and service providers interaction. Um, so a lot of times uh, when clients come to me, they have gone to different clinics where they didn't feel that they were treated with respect and um, and they, so they that stopped them for them to get tested or continue going to those places. So despite the belief that substance users can maintain adherence in, uh, in our experience, 95% of our HIV positive program participants have been capable of maintaining uh, medication. <clears throat> Some other issues, methamphetamine use impair judgment and decision making, party and play leads to an increased number of sexual partners, not knowing the risk related to needle sharing and options to reduce the risk, a high number of untreated STDs, infection with individuals not interested or ready to access drug treatment services. And because they don't access these treatment services, they don't have information of where to get HIV STD testing. Uh, uh, places, right? So we're not aware of the risk, it should be methamphetamine using uh, cool decreased medication adherence uh, because they feel that they probably shouldn't be taking their medication while they are using methamphetamine. Uh, and so it's important for, um, for them to know that's a harm reduction strategy. We do recommend for them to continue using the medication for HIV. <clears throat> so the Paddy Wise program, uh, it's one of the programs uh, as part of all of the substance programs that we have. It was originally developed in consultation with Rafael Diaz and the Cesar Chavez since 2005. Um, I came on board in 2007, and this program specifically is for gay men who use methamphetamine. It's funded by the Los Angeles Department of Public Health Division of HIV and STD programs. Uh, it's a harm reduction based HIV STD prevention program working with active crystal meth using gay men. And um, the program goal is to reduce the opportunities to acquire transmitted HIV and STDs, Hep C, uh, through their sexual drug using behaviors. Some of the activities that happen in this program. So we have uh, health navigation sessions. That is two sessions that happen in a course of two weeks. Um, and we incentivize clients for uh, participating in these sessions uh, at the end of the second session with the $60 in gift cards from Target. And, um, a lot of times clients come just for the $60, you know, and uh, what our goal is to get them linked into one of the services, HIV, STD, uh, put them back into HIV care, uh, PEP, PrEP, one, you know, get them uh, to work on also on some of the goals that they might, uh, that they might feel that they can work at the time, something that is realistic for them. Uh, and so we help them and, and, and achieve those goals. Um, 
So um, this is some of the scope of work. This is our goal average to 628 uh, participants in a 12 month period. Um, and then we also have the integration of a continuously management program for 24 participants in a 12 uh, month period. Uh, it's six to eight weeks or 18 to 24 visits. Um, and participants, uh, they get tested their urine for crystal meth and as long as they stay clean for all this time, they also are incentivized uh, with $500 where they complete eight weeks. Um, and a lot of times, um, not everybody is able to get to the six week, we, you know, without relapsing, but they have to start all over again. We just started this program last year at the end of, well, at the end of uh, this contract year in June, and we were able to complete nine uh, continuous management people that went through continuous management and completed that whole eight weeks. And there are some people that have struggled completing the week, the eight weeks, but they have been able to start all over, start all over, and it, they maintain themselves uh, off map for a while. Um, so. Um, also, uh, we under Sierra Health Foundation funding, we had our direct integration of harm reduction based workshops where we cover uh, subjects like crystal meth 101, HIV, STDs 101, triggers and addiction, kind of like how to identify your triggers, what things can you do to work around those triggers, and things like that. Um, this also is a three sessions uh, workshop and uh, people get incentivized as well with $6 in gift cards when they complete the third uh, workshop. And there's a 30-day follow-up where we talk a little bit about what they learned and how they were able to use the information they learned in these uh, uh, workshops. Um, we also have under Sierra Health Foundation distribution of fentanyl test strips and naloxone spray as requested by clients. And we uh, currently... Uh, we distributed 22,491 test trips in different events in our different locations as well. Um, and um, we continue, uh, people continue coming here, even the police department from Wasali would pay here one day asking for some fentanyl test trips because they need it for their officers. And so things like that. Um, so the party wise program challenges and successes Sorry, I went too fast on that slide. Um, so some of the challenges, uh, lack of HIV and STD testing and treatment uh, during COVID, uh, fear of uh, blood and urine tests for HIV and STDs because of their belief, clients believe that they might be tested for drugs and report it somehow. Um, so, uh, you know, we need to clarify that to clients for, for uh, some lack of confidence in themselves. A lot of times people come in here and they already feel that it's the, it's the end of their life and they don't feel that they can do anything to work on their addiction. Uh, and so those are some of the things in the conversations that we uh, try to help them with and lead them to services that can help them, uh, you know, believe in themselves and, and work on, on their addiction. It's related to HIV medication interaction with substance use, like I had mentioned earlier, fear of an HIV positive test for so while dealing with the drug addiction, homelessness, relationship issues, financial, financial issues. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, as you know, through COVID uh, pandemic as a side effect, we, a lot of, a lot of places had uh, labor shortage uh, through all organization types and job sectors. Uh, and here's some information that when we send the slides, you could go over, but so just wanted to say the party wise, the party wise program, it's not the exception in permanent labor shortage, and it has been a roadblock to recruit and maintain new staff, recruiting and new participants, as well as keep that quality of rapport between clients and staff. So in this time, the COVID time, it has uh, been some of the challenges that, that we have faced. Um, also, some other COVID-related limitations, like I mentioned earlier, no STD testing available at times you know, during COVID. And so uh, I'm mentioning this because during uh, the last uh, contract year, we were not able to test as many people as we used to, you know, because clinics were closed and, you know, everything was about COVID. Uh, people relapsed uh, for many users during the peak of the pandemic, using meth regularly daily as a way to cope. Uh, clients first lack of interest in deal with their drug use and sexual health. Um, clients lack of 
uh, private transportation. Sometimes it could be due to paranoia and sometimes it could be because of the drug effect or it could be because they're really scared of, um, they were scared of getting uh, COVID. Uh, misinformation about COVID and its vaccination. A lot of times people were like, no, this is, uh, this is, I'm not gonna get vaccinated for COVID. And so, and they, and a lot of people still feel that way, people that use uh, methamphetamine. Uh, fear from clients to increase in the risk of COVID exposure. Um, so our response, we try to assist clients in the creation of social support network for HIV, STD testing, as well as with referrals for other services, including COVID-19 COVID vaccination, testing, and uh, now monkey bites related information vaccination. Well, um, include uh, former, so some of the things that is very important for me is to include the participant in the recruitment of new participants. Um, I provide accurate and reliable information about HIV STD testing and treatment. Refer to reliable service providers. If if you have a health center, train your providers to know how to work with uh, substance users. Explain, explain to clients what can be reportable and what is not, so no testing for drugs without their permission, uh, and uh, give clients ownership of their own process on creating the pathway to recovery. Use free and incentivized HIV STD testing to get clients to our door. That's what that would be one of our approach and use the opportunity to expand to conversations about meth use and vice versa. <clears throat> So our response also includes the four strategies of ending the HIV epidemic, you know, treat, prevent, and uh, diagnose, treat, prevent, and, res and respond. So we, uh, when people do our intake form, we always go over their uh, HIV risk and STD risk and all of that and sexual behavior. So uh, we make sure that people in the first session with us are linking to one of these services if they haven't been tested for STDs, HIV, or if they uh, HIV test um, it's negative, we try to link them to PrEP or at least have that conversation with a group navigator to clarify any misunderstandings or any, any questions they have you know, to answer any questions they have. Um, and some of these services like, Luckily for us, they are offered in house, and so we could, uh, you know, just do a, uh, you know, warm hand out to our prep, prep navigator, for example. Um, we remind our participants about the availability of HIV and STD testing as much as possible. Um, it, every time we talk with clients, they have they 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 share their sexual behaviors and. A lot of times there's a lot of sexual partners. And so I think it's important for uh, when you're more sexually active to, to keep testing for HIV and STD. So um, some data from 2019 and, um, sorry, 2019 to 2020. Um, so this collection of data came from participants intake form. Uh, we, uh, uh, data 201 clients, the majority of clients identify as gay cis men, and uh, one of them uh, cis bisexual men. Uh, so 40, 40 uh, of these participants were homeless, 65.7% um, were 131 clients uh, rent or shared unit, 27 had other living arrangements, and only one, I mean, three of them own a home. Also with ethnicity, so 107 were Latinos or Latinx and uh, 65 Black African American, 20 white for Asian, two Native American, one Pacific Islander, and one other that uh, and no Native Hawaiian. <laughs> so, um, so other successes, so the use of substances, whether in, in exchange, oh yeah, there was use of substances, whether it was in exchange for sex or for um, recreational use was very common among program participants. A total of um, 174 report having had exchanged sex for drugs in the past six months. Well, uh, meth was the predominant substance, substance use with 100% of clients reporting using methamphetamine. Uh, there were other substances uh, reported as well. Total of 79 individuals were referred to PrEP services. Uh, 27 program participants were linking to HIV testing. 73 program participants were linked to HIV and STD testing and 97 linking to STD testing. So on. With a total of 197 participants linking to HIV prevention services. Uh, so 201 clients com uh, committed to make a change or uh, sexual and drug use and behavior 
150 of them reported to reach their goal and show changes in behavior. <clears throat> Uh, uh, that are a little bit more older, between 2014 and 2018, we identified and recruited high-risk individuals or their peers who may not have access, uh, may not have access to HIV and SD testing through conversion or HIV testing programs. So uh, we had a total of 801 participants who completed our four sessions weekly workshops that we used to have during this time. With these uh, years, a minimum of 175 clients were tested for HIV and STD each contract year with a total of 1,903 individuals to support HIV STD. 184 former group participants completed three or more weekly support groups. And um, that also we, we offer on Mondays, it's just a, a place for people to come and sit and talk about any subject they want to, or we will uh, bring a subject and um, it's just to eat and talk and have conversations about different subjects. So uh, 38 former group participants completed a 16 hour peer health educators training with a minimum of 85 score on their PhD certification test. So we do a pre-test and a post-test after the training and the peer educators were asked to go and have conversations with their social network, uh, people that they party and play with and um, uh, refer uh, three of them to different services that we offer. Um, and they were getting incentivized, uh, they used to get incentivized $40 a month for their participation and for the recruitment as well. Uh, some lessons learned, keep in mind client state of mind due to the drug use, paranoia, depression, irritability, um, a service provider is important to remind ourselves not to take the client's actions personal, Keep in mind that change cannot be imposed. It's vital to reinforce clients' confidence, remind them that they are com competent of making choices and changes in their lives. Uh, reward and encouragement are more effective than punishment and judgment. It is uh, essential to make sure that our your testing department or allies understand your clients. Some other lessons learned, clients, misinformation is hard to amend. Uh, even when you're providing an accurate information and, it's, um, and it is difficult to change their belief about HIV and STD testing and treatment, you and your HIV testing uh, partner should be aware uh, when giving information as, as clients might not always trust in what you're telling them. And so uh, it's, you know, make, making sure to ask the right questions and to, um, you know, to, to, have, to have them ask questions as well. Um, same as with harm reduction strategies for drug use, when illustrating the benefits of knowing clients HIV status testing for STDs, parents, and all of that, um, it has been helpful to involve the program participants' peers in presenting the information to folks from their social network uh, on their personal time. And I just I, I added this slide because I think it is. Uh, more, one of the most successful things about this program since 2007 has been really getting involved peer educators, and we don't have that anymore. But we, but we still work with some uh, former participants um, in the recruitment of the new participants, and I, I believe that that's the most important message I could tell you if you are uh, doing programs like this one. It's really to involve the uh, the, the participants to, in the recruitment of new participants. You, they can reach to places that we don't have access to normally. Um, there's not everybody that uh, party and play go to bathhouses or go to clubs or go to different places where we could outreach to. So this is a great this is a great way of uh, asking uh, new program participants. Um, and what's in the works? Uh, so party wise program expansion privately funded. So we our target population is gay men who use methamphetamine. Uh, we have the implementation of Getting Off Curriculum, a week's 24 session case specified behavioral therapy. This is facilitated by a certified alcohol drug counselor. Um, and uh, we have weekly harm reduction. We will have weekly harm reduction face groups in the West Hollywood area, monthly digital campaign on Grinder and other social media venues, quarterly town halls, community forums about meth, uh, which I would love to work with any of you out there uh, to, to make this happen um, and to increase uh, community awareness. Um, 
we have been able also to complete uh, eight weeks, 24 sessions, getting a pilot with nine participants out of 12 initial participants at the end of June 2022. Um, and we still are in contact with some of these participants who have access to other, to other services that we have, like contingency management and uh, health navigation sessions as well, and link them into different services. And that is my presentation and my content information. Thank you so much, everyone. Let me stop sharing my screen. Great. Well, wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Roger. Um, so we just heard a fantastic review of strategies at a programmatic level that Roger and APLA Health are using to help address the intersection, um, specifically really of problematic meth use and HIV. And our next presenters will be sharing a grassroots coalition building and advocacy approach that they've implemented to help address the same issue. So joining us from the Wallace Memorias are Richard Zaldivar, founder and executive director, and Gilmar Perdomo, prevention programs manager. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with, with you today, Elena, and all of you here from California. My name is Richard Zaldivar, and I'm the executive director and the founder of the Wall Las Memorias. In the next few minutes, we'll take you on a journey from uh, looking at some of the problems that we have faced here in Los Angeles in regards to crystal methamphetamine and how we are addressing this holistically. Gilmar? <clears throat> First slide. Um, yeah, while we wait on that, uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everybody. My name is Gilmar. I am the Prevention Programs Manager at the Wallace Memorias. Um, I've been leading the Act Now Against Meth Coalition here for the last three years, uh, but it's been around since 2005, and I'll, I'll go over that um, with everybody here. Uh, should I put up the slides? We don't have them. No, sorry, just one moment. Um, Enrique, can you go ahead and share their slides? Perfect. Next right. slide. Next slide. Next one. All right. So this is where I want to start and I want to paint a picture. I know that Roger went a little bit over this and this is really what we talk about is um, where are we with meth in LA? Um, methamphetamine use in HIV positive MSM men who have sex with men led to increased uh, risky sexual behaviors and cause the psychosocial impairment and memory loss, which may decrease adherence to antiviral treatment. So this is a study done in 2008. Um, and it really shows, you know, where, where this, um, where kind of a problem lies here, right? Um, meth is the most commonly used substance among HIV positive MSM, and second most common among HIV negative MSM. Um, and this is from the M study, 2014-2018 cohort. Um, a person who uses meth compared to a non-user is 1.5 times more likely to contract HIV uh, from the SAPSI dashboard. Um, and meth-related deaths from 2010 to 2020 increased up uh, 1,185, so 81 to 1,041. Um, that's from the SAPSI as well. So this really paints a picture of where we're at um, and how we can see that meth is, is a huge issue, uh, not just among the MSM community, um, it also kind of bleeds into other communities, underserved populations in Los Angeles. Um, but we see that meth is something that needs to be addressed um, and it needs a strategy behind. Um, and that's really what we try to do here. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, like I said earlier, Act Now Against Meth has been around since 2005. Um, the Act Now Against Meth Coalition was created in 2005 in response to the lack of attention methamphetamine received from public health officials in Los Angeles. Uh, the coalition included nonprofit organizations, local businesses, public schools, and religious leaders. Um, and this uh, included things like um, other nonprofits that are probably here today, um, but also like bathhouses, um, and, you know, venues where we know that a lot of MSM uh, or community members are at. Um, in 2006, the coalition collected 10,000 
uh, petition signatures demanding the county to address this crisis. Um, and as a result, the Board of Supervisors presented and passed a motion allocating $1.5 million to fund a new prevention and treatment program. And from this, um, you know, organizations had to apply for uh, some of this grant money. Um, a project that we did through this was um, helping ed provide education and prevention services to Latina women who were using meth kind of as a as an energy source, uh, but not really knowing what it was. Um, so that's really how um, you know creative these projects were that came out of this, and why it's so important to fund programs like that. Um, next slide, please. So where we are now. So this is when I like took over in 2019. Um, so in 2019, the rise in methamphetamine use among MSM and other underserved populations prompted the reinstatement of Act Now Against Meth. And if some of you remember, this is a time uh, where the Ed Buck controversies came out. Um, and we really saw that there was um, a rise and an emergency um, to meth in our community. Um, and we really had to do something about it. Um, following the community conversation, following community conversation, uh, these are things uh, that we did to kind of uh, understand where the community was. Um, when it came to meth, um, focus groups, town hall meetings, and a large scale community summit with over 140 community members in attendance. A work group was formed to draft a list of recommendations on addressing meth in Los Angeles. Um, so this is a, a few of them are here from the, um, from the work group. And um, they were pretty much tasked with creating a document. Um, so in December, 2021, the Act Now Against Meth, uh, Los Angeles County Platform Addressing the Meth Epidemic, so this is the, the document, was finalized and approved by the work group. Um, working with Hilda Solis's office, the supervisor, um, a motion was introduced to the Board of Supervisors to directly to direct county departments to provide a plan of action to address stimulant and opioid use. Um, and the motion was passed unanimously on July 26, 2020. And Richard will talk a little bit more about this um, later on in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll pass it back to Richard. Yeah, thank you, Gilmar. And so the process, the community mobilization process included five community conversations, allowing community members to share the insight on meth in their community. We held focus groups with target populations. Now you have to make sure that you realize that this was all done during COVID. So most of this was work was done uh, virtually. We then held two roundtable meetings. These meetings with over 150 community members and health professionals who were in attendance. Creation of a planning committee. Um, the community summit, we held a three hour summit with over 140 people in attendance. Participants provided key insight to develop recommendations in the areas of prevention, treatment and policy. One of our key uh, guest speakers that day was uh, city councilman, Mike Bonnet, who shared openly about his meth addiction and his meth use in the past. Next slide. So from the, the coalition, we developed a platform working group. And here you see even Elena Rosenberg's name and so many, and some of the other folks that are in this call today. The work group consisted of hardcore leaders in the various fields of our community, including members from SAPSI here in Los Angeles. And, and the purpose of the working group to, was to address crystal methamphetamine use in Los Angeles and to develop recommendations to address the epidemic here in Los Angeles. So we embarked on a, uh, a long process, many meetings, uh, working on different recommendations. And these recommendations totaled, totaled uh, 32 um, in, in the platform. Now we call this the Los Angeles platform on crystal meth amphetamines. The platform is our recommendations from a community up uh, telling the public health folks here in Los Angeles what is needed to address uh, methamphetamines here in Los Angeles. The coalition consisted of over 22 organizations, like I said before, but the working group was amazing. They worked tirelessly uh, in coming up with key recommendations. Next slide. 
So as we launched the platform in December 2021, we held a number of meetings to make sure that the platform represented the interest of the Angelinos of Los Angeles. Next slide. So some of the recommendations, you want to go over that, Gilmar? Yeah, sure. And I won't go through all of them just for time, but um, I'll pick some of the more important ones that, that um, we have here. Um, so uh, like Richard said, we split up the, the document into three, prevention, treatment, and policy. Um, inside the prevention, um, I'll do the first one. Um, ensure substance use prevention and treatment referrals are offered to clients accessing HIV, STI, and viral hepatitis screening as well as HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, pre-exposure, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, so PrEP and PEP um, services to promote a holistic approach to wellness. So this is part of a recommendation and a set of recommendations that we put together, um, trying to address silos that exist um, among treatment and prevention um, uh, kind of uh, departments across uh, LA County. Um, a lot of folks were telling us that, like, yes, perhaps in some organizations it does, it, it does kind of, um, the referrals are being made, but this is not across the board, um, and, it, and it needs to be um, for everybody trying to get treatment um, or prevention. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, same as this, uh, improve cultural proficiency among county departments and service providers. Um, what we really wanted to point out here is um, it's not just about providing services in Spanish or, you know, in other languages. It's prof uh, cultural proficiency is more than just a translation. Um, it is about understanding the person about, you know, a, a service given to a gay person is not the same as a trans person. Um, it, and it can't be treated the same way. Um, or a heterosexual person, or, you know, um, in order to provide those very um, targeted services, um, county departments themselves need to have that cultural proficiency. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll do, I think the first one is good. Uh, implement harm reduction principles. It is crucial that LA County to require and promote harm reduction principles in all meth treatment programs to prevent and reduce the negative individual and community consequences of meth. Um, to that end, all meth treatment services across the county must be delivered in accordance with uh, training and harm reduction principles and trauma-informed care. This was a huge issue um, when we had the summit. Um, a lot of folks saw uh, harm reduction as, you know, being on the back of a lot of uh, policy that was being thrown out. Harm reduction was never at the forefront. Um, and we really wanted to uh, make sure that in this document and our recommendations that we saw harm reduction as a great way um, to address the meth, the meth issue in Los Angeles. Um, and it has to be because uh, we need to keep folks in, um, in services, right? Um, and not, not push away those who are probably not ready to get those services. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, I think uh, you, these are uh, a little shortened, but you can see harm reduction principles, um, support efforts to decriminalize drug possession and increase diversion programs. Um, this really points out to the policy that we, that, um, we wanted in place uh, that um, kind of takes away that cycle of, um, of somebody going to jail for drug possession and then falling back into drugs. Um, we really want to be, have a holistic view uh, of how we can help somebody. Um, and this, this really points to that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you do want to see the document, it is on our webpage, uh, the wallacememorias.org uh, forward slash A-N-A-M, Anam. Um, here you can download the platform, view past presentations from our guest speakers, um, view Zoom recordings of our town halls and our summit, um, and you can stay up to date with anything that we uh, we work with. Next slide, please. All right, back to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, and so, in order to, um, and before we went to the County Board of Supervisors, we held a press conference on the steps of the Board of Supervisors building in Los Angeles. Next slide. 
what was so awesome about this movement, and this is not just a program, this is a movement that we created, was we were able to get the tremendous support from Supervisor Hilda Solis, who's been a champion for us and for our cause. Uh, and the entire board of supervisors supported her motion um, and, and the motion of, of the, and uh, in, in to address the issue of crystal meth in Los Angeles County and gave all the departments 120 days to come back with responses, how they intend to address crystal methamphetamine use in the various departments. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of the um, uh, items in, in, the, in the motion that you see in front of you, uh, as you can see here, uh, ensure strategies to address the drug overdose epidemic among populations disproportionately impacted by overdoses, including persons of colors and individuals who are justice involved. Um, and you see some of these recommendations. I don't want to get into the weeds of these. Next um, slide. As you can tell here, the motion encompasses so many departments in the county that each department will have an impact as, as we address methamphetamine use in Los Angeles County, whether it is from the prevention or harm reduction or treatment side. Um, it is really uh, groundbreaking. Next slide. And here you see that the work with county departments who serve people who use drugs expand trauma inform and cultural responsive trainings around harm reduction, overdose prevention, other related topics. And then also the final um, uh, piece of this motion, item number 13, it directs the CEO a legislative affairs team and the county advocates in Sacramento and Washington to coordinate the departments of public health and health services and mental health to advocate to the governor, state legislature, California Department of Public Health and the California Department of Health and Human Services and Congress for additional federal and state response to address substance use and the overdose uh, epidemic. Next slide. And so I just want to say here that, you know, this was not just the Wall Last Memorias, but it was really a coalition of incredible community organizations and incredible leaders. The Act Now Against Meth uh, Community Engagement Model is now being recognized by the US Academy of, of Medicine as a community, a promising practice for community engagement. And what we did here was we worked with local folks and we moved forward in, advocate, in advocacy and also dictating legislation and recommendations and working with elected officials to change the system within the county government. I also wanna say that the Act Now Against Meth Leadership uh, held a meeting uh, with Senator Feinstein's office and the Office of National Drug Policy to look at the new legislation that was signed into law uh, just recently by President Biden to address stimulant use on a national level. So I think moving forward, this is just the beginning. Uh, we are going to be continuing to work with our community partners, our government partners to address and making sure that our, all of our recommendations come to fruition. So on behalf of the Wallace Memorials, I want to thank you for allowing us to be part of this space. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was so wonderful to hear your presentation, Richard and Gilmar. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. We are now going to move into our panel discussion and Q&A. So I'm going to invite our other uh, illustrious presenters to turn their cameras back on and join us. Um, I do want to note that we're still collecting questions in the Q&A. We already have some great ones coming in. Um, I've seen a couple questions also come into the chat. Um, and just as a reminder, if you could put those in the Q&A, that will help us make sure that we don't miss things um, coming into the chat. We wanna make sure to get to as many of your great questions as we can. So we're gonna start with a couple of questions that came in pretty frequently during registration as participants registered for this session, and then we'll move into open Q&A. The first question we'll start with is, in your experience, how does problematic substance use impact HIV prevention and care initiation and outcomes? So how does, you know, how does problematic substance use really contribute both to HIV prevention and care initiation and outcomes. And Alessandra, I wonder if you can help us um, get started with that question. 
Um, sure, I can start with um, one of the kind of consistent um, findings in um, California State Epi, which is that people who inject drugs are far less likely to be retained in care when they have HIV. And they are lost to care, not followed up to care. Um, they are not um, virally suppressed. And um, for a lot of decades, this it was presumed that the reason for this is that they are poorly managing their own medication. But um, what research shows is that they are as adherent as other populations of folks. So the, the systemic barriers, you know, how we as a society are set up to provide medical services is um, really based on what's convenient for us and easy for us, as opposed to what's convenient and easy for people who need the medical services. So I'll just highlight that one piece um, and let my colleagues highlight some of the others because there's a lot there. Thanks, Alessandra. Roger, do you want to speak on that at all? How, how sure. have you been, yeah, how have you seen that work out in your work? Sure. I think that just for what clients express, a lot of times they are not looking for HIV STD testing until they are worried about it because they are experiencing something, or they are sick or uh, you know, something like that, or because they access services uh for different reasons for that incentive, just to give you an idea. And um, in, in a lot of times, that's the only time that they will get that type of information about HIV testing, about HIV care, and all of that. And so, um, yes, yeah, I mean, that's something I can add to it. Thank you. Thank I, you. I just want to add you. here that I think for us, you know, um, as we were addressing in the, as in our presentation about addressing um, pretty much tearing down the barriers of government. And, and bureaucracies to address crystal meth. Uh, we look to the same thing in our prevention efforts. Uh, our, our HIV prevention and testing teams now are incorporating meth prevention and harm reduction practices. And so, you know, we, although we get funding to do this work from different silos of government, we also believe that we gotta like in, integrate uh, the various issues and, and causes and roots of, of the problem uh, in our approach to community. I think that's what we need to do. And another thing I saw in, in the chat, someone saying, why is there such a uh, high use among Latinos? First of all, Latinos have, we have a higher population in our community. But the other thing that we have to understand is uh, the tremendous amount of stress um, and mental uh, health issues that our community goes through. Um, one being of uh, the, the whole issue that a lot of our, of our community members are depressed. Uh, and if we're not treating depression, and if we're not treating the roots of, of the causes of mental illness, then uh, we're going to see increases, not only among the crystal meth or, or, or other drug use, but also an increase of HIV and STDs and other issues. So we really need to start looking at the roots of, uh, that contribute to a lot of the issues that we're looking at in, in health. Thank you, Richard. Gilmar, did you want to chime in on this question? Yeah, sure. Really quick, an anecdote that I've that I've heard um, from one of the clients. Um, you know, sometimes it's not about adherence. Maybe it's a situational issue. I know of a client who um, was selling their um, suppression medication in order pretty much to survive. Right? Somebody was buying it off her. Um, and I and I can imagine this happening for a lot of communities for a lot of folks. Um, is there are many other issues um, when HIV is probably one one that they don't really they can think of you know putting it on the side. So it, it, there needs to be a, a lot more attention to um, the determinants of health. Yeah. Thank you. So now we'll move to our next question from registration. Um, another question that really commonly came up was 
what strategies are recommended to help maintain retention in HIV care and also medication adherence um, among folks who, uh, who use substances. Um, so I wonder, I know Roger, you touched on this a little bit um, as part of your presentation. Maybe you can start us off um, with those strategies and then we'll, um, we'll pass it around. Did you mind repeating the question? I'm so sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the question is what strategies are recommended to help maintain retention in HIV care and medication adherence among people who use substances? So to be honest, in our experience, um, most clients have been able to keep taking the medication. Um, so I don't know if it's because we are a AIDS Project Los Angeles, you know, formerly. And so a lot of the clients that access services through us are people who already know the HIV status and have been uh, taking medication already. But we do have a program uh, were for new uh, diagnosed individuals that they will be followed for a period of six months and they will have a visit with um, this uh, uh, navigator, if you wish, uh, um, that will call them and remind them about their appointment. Uh, and there's also some incentive at a certain period, like every uh, at the third month, at the six months or whatever, you know, that they would, um, that they will accumulate, you know, points towards them. So they, if they continue coming to their visits, that they continue seeing their doctors, taking the medication, all of that. So that's, I mean, that's one that I can talk about. It's not part of my programs, but it's something that we're doing here and it's useful for my clients as well. Um, I have noticed also, I saw on the chat the question about positivity rate. We, I, we don't really have that information because we do linkage to our health center. And so we don't know the test result. You know, for uh, if somebody is HIV positive, we don't know that information because that's not us who does the test, you know, so facilitate the test. But I wanted to um, I wanted to say that um, recently after COVID, I have noticed a high number, a higher number of individuals who are becoming HIV positive or testing HIV positive. And we had to, and, and that's why we have to link them into this other service that we have, this other program that we have. But I, I have noticed an increase on, on that. But I want to share that with you guys. Thank you so much, Roger. And um, just to note for, for folks on the line, Roger was just responding to a question that came into the Q&A, which was of the number of clients referred to HIV and STD testing, what was the positivity rate? Um, so thank you for that, Roger. Any other comments from our panelists on this question? So again, the question is what strategies are recommended to help maintain retention in HIV care and medication adherence among people who use substances? Um, I could add something else. Sure. So uh, a lot of times clients um, are dealing with other things, which I'm sure pretty much everybody knows, right? So homelessness, uh, you know, relationship issues, mental issues, and so mental health issues. And so we, um, we, I try to, when we have our health navigation sessions to refer clients to that that they need first, because if, I mean, if they're not ready to start taking their HIV medication, there's, you sending them to the doctor is not going to change anything. It's not going to do nothing for them. So we have to address these other issues that they are dealing with at the same time or first. Um, and uh, that's something I, that I believe could benefit uh, people dealing with substance use. I, I just want to add another thing, Elena. I, I yeah, think from our experience, um, from the beginning of our organization, we built an AIDS monument, the only one um, standing monument in the country. And it was because of the activism from our target population. It was gay Latino men who really carried the ball and it expanded to the entire community. And so I really believe, we really believe that one way of keeping our, our clients engaged and retained is to get them engaged in community and get them in the area of advocacy, uh, something that they could be, feel proud of. When we talk about our community in, in general today, I know that in the HIV community, in the HIV workforce, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of stress, burnout, uh, we're dealing with a, a high level of isolation and depression. And so what better way to, uh, to address this issue, but 
recruiting our clients into advocacy where they're working with other people in the community where they could work out and they can go to their home and feel proud of their contributions back to their people. So that's what one of the ways that we're addressing and uh, retaining our clients. And if I could I just could add- I could not love oh. that more. <laughs> I could not <laughs> love that more. That is like so right on because what happens with most approaches to substance use is that what the provider says is, I believe you can be a good person sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Not now, right now you're a bad person, but you're, a, you're going to be. And so giving people something right now that fully invests in who they are in this moment, they don't have to be any different to feel pride and feel ownership over what happens next for their community. I love your answer. Thank you. Uh, I, Gilmar, were you going to say something? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Richard said. Um, in other ways that we address this is um, education for community about kind of themselves, right? I think um, we have support groups that we talk about like self-discovery, um, issues on like generational shame, right? Uh, sexual shame that we all have that. And that really does contribute to someone taking their medication or not. Um, so it's got to be not just one course, but we do it throughout, you know, the year. Um, and that, that really does help. Go ahead, Dr. I just wanted to add to, to what you all say. Um, with uh, the presentation, if you remember, I talk about peer health educators and being involved in the outreach and all of that. Now, it's not just good for the program, but also like Richard said, making people feel that they are useful. That, uh, that actually have shown a lot of changes uh, throughout the years. In, in their the substance use of those people that participated at Pure Health Educators and that went out, they actually felt part of something, you know, they felt useful and we were not asking them to change their life or to do anything different than the way they were doing. So we were not judging them for what's happening, but more of empowering them to be able to help us make these changes and at least to minimize the risk and the harm related to their drug use, you know, and their friends' drug use. And so, um, we, I, I, I have seen peer health educators that have gone to treatment, into drug treatment, um, that have become nurses and that have uh, changed their life completely just by being peer health educators. And it's very interesting because they will come to me and say, hey, thank you, Roger. And I'm like, this is you. I mean, you did everything. You went out there for two, three years doing outreach, uh, you know, skip row, doing needle exchange, helping us, doing all of these different events, gay rights, and they really feel empowered. And so I just, I mean, I just wanted to, uh, you know, add that to all of your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you'll see in the chat, there's a lot of appreciation from, um, for all of your, you know, really powerful responses. And, you know, I think especially emphasizing the importance of empowering community members and, and also ad addressing um, kind of broader social determinants of health and, and needs that might be contributing um, to the challenges that they're facing. So thank you so much for your responses. I want to move to um, our last question that commonly came up during registration, and then we'll just move into some more open Q and A. Um, this question is NIMBYism. So, um, for anyone not familiar with that, that's not in my backyard. NIMBY, NIMBYism can be a challenge when working to implement some interventions to reduce harm among pe people who use drugs, such as syringe exchange, um, which Alessandra talked to us a little bit about earlier. Do you have any suggestions to combat NIMBYism and increase support for these types of interventions? Um, and maybe we could start with you, Richard and Gilmar. Actually, Gilmar, you mentioned a little bit of addressing stigma. And I think, you know, that's something maybe um, it would be great if you two could talk a little bit more about addressing stigma and, and NIMBYism as part of this work. Um, so I think a great way to talk about this is our monument, right? It is in Lincoln Heights, um, up there, kind of north, what is it, northeast LA, um, an area, and we we really rallied the community around um, building this monument in a location that is uh, largely Latino um, at a time when uh, they did not want to talk about HIV. They did not want to um, have uh, something related to HIV in their community. 
Um, but it did take a lot of, you know, talking to the neighbors, going door to door, um, talking to the political leaders, religious leaders, bringing them all together um, in order to gather that support um, and really addressing that, that stigma that really exists. Um, Richard, would you like to add anything on that? Yeah, I just want to say, um, and, and, and for Alessandra's of, of, uh, uh, point here is that at the, we would talk about the AIDS monument, the AIDS monument is also funded by the state of California and uh, the county and the city of Los Angeles. In order to get that kind of funding, we had to organize the community. And so when we talk about the stigma, I think it's important that when we address issues that are highly um, connected to a some type of stigma that we come from, we're very focused in educating community. Um, and I think being very honest and transparent and to say that these are our concerns, this is what happens when you engage in this act or this field or this, this um, intake um, and allow people to grow into their own being. Right, so if you give them the education, but you also empower them to know what the what the uh, other options could be, uh, I think people want honesty. Today's society, uh, you hear a lot of talking points, but not any really true conversation. And so I think our clients, our people in our community, really just want the truth, and they want an honest conversation. You know, the way to fight stigma is to be transparent and to be bold and to think of yourself as a leader so that you can carry that message to those who are seeking support and information. Thank you both so much. Alessandra, did you wanna to touch on this as well? Yeah, um, I agree. Um, I think if we think of people who want harm reduction services as us, there actually are more of us than there are of them, uh, uh, them being NIMBYs. Um, and so organizing community around um, self-care for our community is um, really useful. And then there's some kind of practical stuff like you can, if you are interested in a syringe services program in your community, you can start with an overdose prevention program. Because even though that was controversial 10 years ago, now everybody thinks, okay, how about people don't die? And so, you know, a good example is of a, you know, rural county in a conservative area, Shasta County. They started out by having a syringe disposal program and they did kiosks throughout the county. And then they did, um, what do they do next? Then they did overdose prevention and then they did a syringe services program. And that's a similar process was used in Plumas where they started with something that everybody could agree on. And, um, and then when they opened their needle exchange, um, veterinarians who had no place to dispose of their syringes came and, and used their syringe services program to dispose of their syringes for their cats and their horses. So there was like a lot of community building that was done. In some ways, it's almost easier in small towns because everybody knows each other and they went to high school together. And so they can do sort of that, um, that community building. But I think the other piece is the voices of people who use drugs, uh, the voices of people with HIV, the voices, uh, you know, getting people that energy that they um, ask for, you know, when someone comes and say, I demand that you do this, instead of saying, oh, okay, uh, well, let's see what we can do instead and saying, oh, thank you. And I demand that you do this. Um, so always having a, always have a counter proposal when someone comes and demands that you change what you're doing. Re be respectful, be friendly, um, welcome the opportunity to work together but always have something that you're gonna ask for as well. Thank you. Roger, did you wanna to touch on this at all? I think the only thing I can add to everything that has been said is about the clients when they have uh, self-shaming and when they feel that because of their sexual behaviors and their drug use behaviors, they're not a good person. I mean, that's also another way that we can start working on that, right? Uh, just kind of like educating and making them feel um, 
you know, more empowered, you know, feel less, you know, shame about what they're doing, but also helping them change, make the changes that they want to make, you know, through helping them clear that up. That's the only thing I could add to that. I will put one thing in the chat, which is a link to a webinar that was done recently about legal work that has around the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. And that if you zone to exclude, um, you know, aid service organizations or um, syringe services programs or methadone programs, you are in fact discriminating against people that have a disability that is protected by the ADA. And I really love that webinar. That was last week. I'll post, I'll um, paste paste the link in right now. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And I see a few other folks also have been sharing resources in the chat. So I'll be sure to um, grab any resources shared in the chat and send them out to everyone after the webinar as well. Um, well, thank you all so much for those responses. And I just want to um, appreciate that. I, I feel like we have some really great uh, kind of different perspectives on here with Roger from a very kind of programmatic direct service lens and um, Richard and Gilmar talking, speaking from kind of a grassroots advocacy and coalition building lens and um, Alessandra bringing kind of the, the state department of health perspective. So thank you all so much for, you know, kind of sharing these different perspectives and lenses with us. Um, now we're going to move into just some open Q&A. So again, participants on the line, feel free to continue submitting questions to the Q&A box as you have them. We'll get through as many as we can during the session today, and we'll follow up on any that we're not able to get to in the time we have. Uh, the first question I wanted to get to is one for you, Richard and Gilmar. Um, this question is, I would be interested in how many members of the platform group personally dealt with meth addiction. It would be great to have former meth users or current meth users on the panel for firsthand knowledge of what could or would work or not. So how were current or former meth users involved in that process, if at all? I can only tell you from what I know. So from the work group, I would say there were, um, and again, this is a privacy issue. So, you know, uh, I could assume from their share, there was a few folks who had used crystal meth. Uh, from our participants uh, in uh, many of the organizations, there were a number of folks who were former users and one active user so that I know of. So um, that's always up to the individual to be transparent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so another question we have here is, um, what will be the benefit of paying individuals to stop using? So I think this is um, kind of getting at the contingency management um, programming. Uh, Roger, I, th I think this question was directed towards you. What, what is the benefit uh, potentially of, of paying individuals to stop or reduce their drug use? So, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that, I, that comes to my mind is, when people are trying to access drug treatment services and they're actively using, it's really difficult for them to really take that big step. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times if they're dealing with other things like homelessness and other things like that, that's another uh, roadblock to get there. Um, so uh, I have seen a participant, for example, that has been trying to maintain himself clean of meth uh, for the eight weeks and then he kept relapsing but then he could picking up himself and stay another six weeks and stay another six weeks. And so it's now it's all this time that he's been, uh, you know, uh, king of math. And he expressed to me how easier it is now not to think of using um, and how now he feels more prompt to really go and access uh, some kind of treatment, you know, a drug treatment. And so that is one of the benefits, you know, so everybody, everybody works different and everybody's ready to go into drug treatment services and just, you know, do it. And some people do it and some people relapse and come back. And so, and they don't want, and they don't want to go back to treatment because they feel like I already went there. I already did that and it didn't work out for me. So I want to do something else. I don't want to be, uh, you know, in a, in treatment. I want to be able to work or whatever, you know, so. I mean, that's, that's some of the things I can think of. Um, maybe Alessandra could add, uh, add something to it about continuous management, maybe. Um, no, I think, 
I mean, I think you covered it. It's um, it's an interesting um, and exciting solution, actually. It's got such great um, results. Um, there's People are, are definitely still working on medication um, that would work as well. I, I talked to a physician who does street medicine the other day, and she said, well, you know, a lot of people want Adderall, but I have to evaluate them first to see if they have ADHD. And um, I'll say, you know, 95% of them actually do. So, um, but Adderall does not work for a lot of people. So like continuing those other, to explore those other possibilities while contingency management, the pilot rolls out, um, I think it will be a really important part of our solution. Thank you so much. Um, I can also share, I, I see Dr. Harawa um, has shared in the chat a little bit about the kind of evidence base for contingency management. Um, and I can also share, this is um, an area that our center director here at UCLA CHIPS um, has done a lot of work around and, and I can be sure to um, send out also some studies, some recent studies around contingency management and also, as Alessandra mentioned, some interesting work around medications for um, meth addiction treatment as well. So um, lots of interesting work going on in that space. I'd like to turn to um, another question. This is for you, um, Alessandra, to, to start with. The question is, um, are, is there any kind of innovative treatment um, that uh, is being worked on that you know of kind of across the state for addressing polysubstance use in um, the HIV positive population? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I will say that um, I think we should stop calling it polysubstance use because most people who use substances use more than one substance. And so we need to start talking about mono substance use. Um, mono substance use is a little bit more common um, with heroin than any other substance, but um, so, so I don't know the answer, but I, I think it's a great question. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for the, the note about mono substance use as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, we also have a question um, that, that just reads, please address chemsex. How is this contributing? To the HIV epidemic, <clears throat> um, Roger, do you see do you see that as part of your work very much? Not really. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. How about you, Alessandra? Anything um, kind of from the state level that you've seen around kind of patterns around chemsex and the intersection with the HIV epidemic? Um, that's a good question too. Um, I think a lot of the work has been done locally. Um, there is, people have a very strong feelings about whether or not um, the state has something to say about how they should have sex. Um, this has shown up a lot in um, recently in, in monkeypox in terms of like what, what guidance do people want? Um, a lot of times they just don't want it from their government. Um, so I would defer to other people on this call or even on, you know, to talk with us about what, what work they're doing around chemsex. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And yeah, for participants on the line, absolutely. If this is if this or any of the other kind of topics we're discussing um, sparks something you know related to your work, please feel free to share in the chat or, or send me an email as well, and I can um, share that information with participants. That's, um, we have a few other questions I'm hoping we can get to in our limited time together. So another is, are you finding um, that meth users are also um, often addicted to fentanyl or are you finding a major link between kind of the meth use and um, fentanyl use here in California? I don't know, could I quickly add on the Chemsex part? Oh, with, absolutely, with go ahead, Gilmar. Yeah. yeah, so so what I'm really seeing, especially our, our organization, um, is when Chemtex in itself, you know, um, kind of organize people together, so cool. Um, it's when you include maybe low income or people of color um, who cannot, you know, maybe have to go to work the next few days. Um, that's when it really starts becoming a problem is can they function when they go back to work? Um, will they lose their job? Will they... Um, have these repercussions come after? Um, I know I've I've heard from um, some of our uh, white clients who have 
um, I, I don't remember the name of this pill, but it, it, it kind of increases your dopamine levels. Um, after, like, and so the, the come down after doing using these drugs is less severe than without it. Um, so they can necessarily essentially function after t doing, uh, you know, maybe like a, a bender on the weekend. Um, so they can function. But those who don't have access to this or maybe don't know about it, um, it essentially cannot function. Um, and that's when it becomes a problem. That's what, I, that's what I've been seeing. Thank you, Gilmar. Um, so I, again, just getting at this question of um, kind of the intersection of meth use and fentanyl use and, and particularly fentanyl addiction. Um, can any of you speak to that question? Are you, are you finding a, a big intersection there? I know, I know there's been a lot of discussion here in LA about that, um, about that recently. Any thoughts on that question? I think one of the, one of the shifts that's happened in the last five years is that we are no longer talking about fentanyl contamination or fentanyl. It, it, people are purchasing fentanyl that is explicitly called fentanyl. Um, it is true that it, it will still show up in pills that are advertised as Norco or some other thing, but that's kind of a different drug market. But in, in most of California now, people can purchase fentanyl explicitly labeled as fentanyl. Um, and so, so yes, it is very common, especially for people who are um, accessing syringe services programs to be using both fentanyl and, um, and methamphetamine and um, you know, fentanyl is more likely to be um, daily, and methamphetamine is more likely to be um, you know specific spurts of use that last for you know uh, three or five days at a time. So there's different use patterns. Um, it is you know there is not quite the same um, kind of two different communities that there, there there used to be. You know, for those of us who have been around for a long time, and like there were you know those people use that drug and those people use that drug, there's much more um, kind of mixing of, of drugs and communities. And there's, there's, but there still are a lot of small subsets of communities and, you know, who keep continuing with this communitarian approach to, um, to reducing harm. I think that is one way for us to tap in is simply by asking people questions. Who do you hang out with? Who do you enjoy? Who do you try to avoid because they make you nervous? You know, those kinds of questions. What kinds of drugs are you using right now? What do you enjoy? What do you like about them? What do you hate about them? What would you like to change a little bit in order to, you know, just make more room for the things that you enjoy? Are you interested in taking a vacation from any of your drugs? You know, those are the kinds of questions that we can integrate into the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for just one more question. And um, Gilmar, this question is for you. The question is, is the LAUSD school board receptive to the Act Now Against Meth efforts and educational recommendations? Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, we, I don't think we've had discussions necessarily about this, but when we do have discussions about either like tobacco or maybe uh, marijuana kind of education, there is a lot of resistance from LAUSD. Um, so, you know, I would imagine there might be for this as well. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we had so much more time <laughs> to chat, but, um, again, for participants on the line, if you still have questions that you'd like to ask our participants, feel free to put them in the Q and A quickly now, or send me an email and, um, I'll be sure to work with our amazing panelists to get you, um, the responses that you're looking for. Um, meanwhile, I just want to thank our amazing panelists one more time for being on the line with us and sharing your amazing work and your insights and wisdom with the group. And I'd like to thank all of our participants for your attention and engagement and your great questions. Um, I did want to just note one more time that we are recording the session and um, please just look out for a follow-up email from me that will include a link to our brief evaluation form and information about the recording and slides and the resources shared in the chat. And meanwhile, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.